I am actually going to be closing out our I've Got Questions sermon series by team teaching with three of our leadership students. And so would you put your hands together and welcome to the stage some of our JLA students. Awesome. Uh, they are going to be team teaching with me uh, today and make sure when they grab, grab the mic and they begin preaching that you absolutely encourage them and shout them down. And because the, I remember what it was like when I first preached. And listen, if it's as long as it's biblical, say amen. All right. As long as what they're saying is Bible, shout them down, encourage them. Uh, when I was 12 years old, my senior pastor gave me the microphone to preach on a Sunday morning. Journey Youth don't get any ideas. I would never do that <laughs> with you guys. But it was a moment that marked me and I promised to create opportunities for the next generation. How many people know we have to keep the Jesus story going one more generation? That's our job until he returns. So we're going to keep it going. And we're going to speak today uh, and we're going to ask the question found in the book of Psalms, chapter 13, verse 1 through 2. 1 through 2. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? The question that we want to ask today is how long? We look up to heaven and we ask God how long? We didn't know that the tragedy would happen this week when we decided to put this message in the series. But sometimes you can look at the world around you and go, how long, Lord? How long? Is there anybody waiting for anything in church today? I wonder if there are any parents waiting for their kids to come into their life. How long? Maybe there's some parents waiting for their kids to leave their life. How long? He's 23, Lord. How long? Is he going to... Maybe there's a single person asking the Lord, how long until the love of my life comes into my life? Or a married person that's asking themselves, how long is my spouse going to be crazy? Lord, how long is this fool going to learn to put away his socks in the hamper? How long, Lord? I think we all have moments in our life when we question the timetable of God. And I want to share just a quick story of something that happened with our sons recently. I was coming back from a wedding and it was about an hour and 15 minute drive and they had their Nintendo Switches in the back and they were playing video games. And I just felt led by the Holy Spirit to tell them to shut it off. I just felt led. And, uh, and I don't know if it was God or not, but I just, I just, I wanted to, it was, it wasn't that I was annoyed at the games that they were playing. They still had time on, for their day in their video game, but I just told them, I need you guys to just shut it off, just be in the car with me. And they said, why? And, uh, and I said, because you need to learn to be bored. I've noticed a pandemic happening in our children. And it is the, the, the need for, in, for consistent stimulation. Because they grew up in a different world than you and I grew up in. At least when I was a kid, the cartoons, like you at least had commercials. You at least had to wait a little bit to get to the, and they only showed up on Saturday mornings. Y'all have no idea about that. You get to watch cartoons whenever you want. When I was a kid, you had one day, you had three hours on that day, and that was it. But now they get to watch everything on demand at the, at the tip of their fingers. And I said, guys, you're going to have to learn to be bored. And, and I want you to know and I'm doing this for a reason. Because one day you're going to be in college in a course that doesn't seem to make sense. And if you don't learn how to be bored, you're going to check out of that class. One day you're going to have a job. And if you don't learn how to be bored, you're going to check out of that job. Not everything in life is exciting and awesome. In fact, life is often built on the boring moments, on the moments when nothing seems like it's happening. And so I want you to know I'm developing you. And that's why I want you to do this. But also, just so you know, and I didn't tell them this part, but in my mind, I knew what I was doing. I wasn't just telling them to wait because I was developing them. I was also taking them to go get ice cream. So I wasn't going home. I was going to go ice cream. There was a reward for their wait. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I wasn't just developing them. I was also delivering them. When God puts you in a season of waiting, when, when you're looking up to heaven, you're asking God how long, you need to know that he is not only developing things inside of you, but he is also taking you somewhere that you are going to be grateful for when he takes you there. When you ask the Lord how long, his answer is, I am preparing you. I am preparing you. And this next phrase right here, this is what somebody came to church for today. You need to hear, listen to me. Something is happening when nothing is happening. Something is happening when nothing is happening. 
I believe God is preparing you. And if there's anyone in the Bible who knows about having to wait for the dream that God gave you. It's a young man named Joseph who received a dream that he was royalty, but did not step into that season, did not receive that dream for quite a few years. I love the fact that he was a young person because we've got young people here today. And I think if there's any season of life when you have to learn to wait the most, it's when you're young. All the young people said, amen. You know, you gotta gotta wait to graduate. You gotta wait to get a worker's permit. Then you gotta wait to get a driver's permit. Then you gotta wait to get a driver's license. Then you gotta wait to get married. And you gotta wait to have sex when you get married if you do it God's way. And you gotta wait to really find your career. And then you gotta wait. There's just a lot of waiting. And I think if you're young today, you're gonna hear today's message being delivered by young people and be able to relate and be able to say, well, I'm glad someone knows how I feel. If you're not quote unquote young person today. And I don't really know what that even means. Um, But uh, if you don't identify as as that, you can look at the young people today and remember what it was like to be young because there's still a young, impatient person inside of every one of us. There's still someone inside of you who cannot wait to get to the next season. And if you're not careful, you'll rush what God wants to do in your life today. So as we ask the Lord how long, we're gonna hear a message on preparation because that's why you're waiting. So put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Mariana Diaz. God bless you, Journey Church. If I haven't had the honor of meeting you yet, my name is Mariana and I'm a first year JLA student. Today, I wanna be talking about the posture of preparation. As Pastor JJ mentioned, we'll be talking about Joseph and we'll be reading from Genesis 37. In this passage, passage, Joseph is 17 years at the time and he was considered to be the miracle child. I mean, his Jacob, or Jacob, his father, was 91 when Joseph was born, so that tells you a lot. Joseph was known to have the gift of dreams and he could interpret them. In the next verses we'll be reading, he receives the gift of dreams and we're going to see how he handled it when the dreams came. Genesis 37 verses 3 to 11 reads, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated Joseph because his father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon, Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun moon and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Posture. It's defined as a posi- the position in which someone holds their body up when they're standing or sitting. All my life, my mom was always in my corner with one hand on my chest, one hand on my back, pulling me up, ready to fix my slouch. She was like, Mariana, it's bad for you. Stand up straight. Anybody else? She wasn't wrong, though. You see, the posture that we have, it's the foundation for every move our body makes, and it can determine how well our body adapts to the stresses on it. In the beginning of April, I went to the hospital for major back pain. They sent me home with three things, pain medicine, a very large medical bill, and paperwork of how to treat back pain. And you want to know what was on the very first page? Fix your posture. It's so interesting how damaging a bad posture can be. I mean, I could barely walk. I could barely take a step. It was so painful. But it just makes me think, well, how damaging a bad internal posture can be as well. You see, posture, it's not just your physical posture. It's also things that we don't see. It's how we approach a certain situation. And it's our attitude. For Joseph, we can see here that he postured himself with the attitude of pride. At the very least, he was the miracle child. He was Jacob's favorite son that gave him a special colorful robe. He was 
God-given dreams where his whole family were all bowing down to him could have tempted Joseph to be prideful. The fact that he shared his dreams with his brothers knowing that they were jealous and hated him so much were hints of some pride in Joseph's heart. And so being that Joseph postured himself in pride, it took him places he didn't intend to go. He was not prepared for what was coming next. His brothers hated him so much that they threw him in a dark, scary pit alone and afraid. And soon after, he was sold into slavery. But God revealed his heart in that moment. And he shifted his prideful heart to one response a posture of humility. We will see that sometimes God needs to take us out of a certain environment because that's what God did. He took him out of his father's house alone only to depend on God. And so for us, God needs to take us out of certain environments to change our posture, to change our attitude. Sometimes God needs to change certain plans in our lives and take us on a detour so that we can shift our posture solely to depend on him. And so when we adjust our posture, we will be able to adapt to change. For a long time in my life, it was very hard to adapt to change. Like Joseph, I had a whole plan for my life. I was excited. I told everybody that I knew. I had the attitude of this. There's nothing that can change it, and there's nothing that can stop it. I was going to go to ultrasound sonography school, and I did all my prerequisites. I applied for the program, and then a month later, I received an email a rejection letter per se. I was angry, I was confused. I prepared so hard and paid a lot of money out of pocket to receive a rejection letter. I was confused, I didn't know what to do next, but I knew that in that moment I was reminded of Proverbs 16 verse nine. It says that we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. When I felt like I had no direction, I was confused, I was afraid, I felt alone, I changed my posture from this prideful, only focused on my plans to this. I came humbly before the Lord and I asked him, God, I don't know where to go now, but I know that only you can direct my steps. I come humbly in surrenderance unto you, Lord, please guide me. And throughout all these years, I've learned that how we approach our future involves prayer and preparation more than predicting and planning. And so I changed my posture. I changed my attitude. And the Lord guided me to join JLA and everything was made clear. You see, I've been in ministry for seven years. And in those seven years, I've always felt a tug in my heart to make this full time. I mean, I've discipled youth. I've preached, I've encouraged, I've been a leader. Everything that I have prepared for has led me to where I am now, but I couldn't see that because my posture was hindering me from seeing my purpose. You see, sometimes we tend to posture ourselves like little kids when they don't get what they want. You tell them it's too late to eat that chocolate bar and they barge into their rooms with their arms crossed and their head down, paying no mind to anything that's in front of them. How many of us have had that kind of attitude where we missed out what was right in front of us? That's why I tell you it's so important that when we adjust our posture, we will be able to change our perspective. Maybe in the midst of your preparation, you didn't get the position that you worked so hard for. Maybe in the midst of planning your wedding, it's been pushed back over and over again. Or maybe in the midst of trying so hard to get pregnant, you just keep receiving a negative result. But the one question that I ask you today is, how's your attitude through all this when things don't go as expected? Are you blaming those around you? Are you blaming yourself? Are you so angry and disappointed that you just feel like giving up? Are you doubting God? Are you doubting the plans that he has for you? You see, for Joseph, nothing went as expected. He had all these dreams that the Lord gave him, and to start off, he didn't believe that he would fulfill his purpose being stuck in a pit. But as we continue his story, we will see that he didn't question God not one bit. You see, 
It's as if Joseph was ready for every detour that was coming his way only because he chose to humbly surrender. What I love about Joseph's story is that it is a true testament to Matthew 23, 12. It says, for those who exalt themselves will be exalted and those who, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And it says, ultimately, it is submitting to God that Joseph shows his humility. Throughout his wild journey that he embarks on, he, it's only his trust in God that keeps him grounded because he knows that the plans that God has for him will be fulfilled. Psalms 145.13 says, for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. In the midst of our preparation, things will most likely not go our way. We will go on some detours, some longer than others, but God is gracious in his promises to us. No matter how how you have postured yourself, whether it is with pride, fear, anxiety, or even doubt. God seeks to reveal what is in your heart and transform it. He seeks to get rid of anything that stands in the way of him fulfilling his promises to you. So while you're preparing for your career, while you're preparing for your, a big move, or while you're preparing for a baby along the way, I encourage you to posture your heart humbly in a surrenderance. And that is the posture of preparation. Come on, hey Journey, my name is Christian, and I am also a first year JA Lay student. Come on, didn't Mariana just crush that? Man, I am the luckiest man on earth because I get to call her my wife. Come on, somebody. Today, the point I want to speak on is the pain of preparation. And I remember in high school during my summers, in the hot Florida summer, having to wake up at 6 a.m. for football workouts. Now, these weren't your normal workouts, you know, deadlifting, squatting, bench pressing. No, no, no. These were like, Lord, take me now kind of workouts. Anybody ever been there where you get pushed to your limit that you don't even feel like doing it anymore? Well, that was me. But the pain that I experienced there would prepare me for when game day came around. So I would be ready for that moment. I want to continue looking at three moments in Joseph's life when he experiences pain. The first moment we see is the pain of being betrayed. Genesis 37, 18 through 20 says, When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We'll tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. This is some real family feud. The betrayal and the jealousy of his brothers went so deep that they decided to kill him. Betrayal is painful. Like the betrayal of your 1998 Honda Civic breaking down on you while you're trying to impress your girlfriend. Or the betrayal of your dog that you've trained for two years decides to break everything in your house because you trusted him to be a good boy. But honestly, maybe the betrayal of a family member who physically abused you or a spouse who cheated on you. Betrayal is painful. Luckily in Joseph's story, his brothers don't kill him. They actually sell him into slavery like Mariana talked about. And there he works for a man named Potiphar. And he became second in command over everything that Potiphar owned. And the only thing that he had to worry about, the Bible says, was what food he decided to eat that day. And I wish that's how Joseph's story ends, but it doesn't. The second moment Joseph experiences pain is the pain of injustice. Potiphar's wife began making moves on Joseph every day, every day trying to sleep with him, but Joseph was ignoring her. So one night she goes to Joseph and tries to sleep with him one more time and he denies her because he experienced the pain of betrayal before. Catch this, so he didn't want anyone else to feel that same pain that he did before. Joseph's pain of betrayal set him up for this moment so he would not repeat the same mistakes his brothers made. Genesis 39, 19 through 20 says Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. I can't imagine being innocent of something, yet having your name dragged on the dirt. But you know what? Joseph overcame that as well. 
Joseph was in charge of everything in the prison. The warden, he became having favor with him. And he was in charge of all of the prisoners and every event that took place there. And in prison, he meets two men. One is a chief cupbearer for Pharaoh, and the other is a chief baker. And they both have dreams. And in these dreams, they go to Joseph, and they ask him, can you interpret these dreams for us? Joseph could have easily said no, but because he could relate to their injustice of being betrayed as well, he interpreted their dreams. After he interpreted them, they came true. The cup barrel gets put back into the palace with Pharaoh. But before he does, Joseph tells him, tell Pharaoh I have been wrongfully accused. Please come help me. But the cup bearer forgets about Joseph. This is the third moment we see that Joseph experiences pain. It is the pain of being forgotten. Anybody been there before? Anybody feel forgotten? Like God has turned his back on you? I remember in 2016, my family and I, we lost our home and we were living in, in different places with our friends. And one day after not seeing my father for a while, we ended up having lunch. And while we were speaking, I remember him telling me, I've done everything God has asked me to do. I've tried to raise you kids right. I've tried to be a good husband. But at this moment, it feels like God has forgotten me. Maybe you're a couple who have had miscarriages after miscarriages and it feels like God has abandoned you. Or maybe you've lost somebody close to you and you're asking yourself, God, where are you? And God's response is this, I am here. Deuteronomy 31, six says, be strong and courageous, have no fear for I will never leave you nor forsake you. So even though I feel forgotten, I know God is truly there. What I love about the story of Joseph is that in every single moment of his pain, God was with him. Genesis 39.2 says, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. In the middle of his betrayal, the Lord was with him and he overcame betrayal. Then he deals with injustice and gets falsely imprisoned. But here's what Genesis 39, 21 says. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison, showing him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite in the prison. Joseph was in prison, yet found favor overcoming the injustice. He then interprets the dreams, but gets forgotten. And it just feels like Joseph can't catch a break. He is betrayed. He deals with injustice and he is forgotten. Anyone ever been there? It feels like life is a roller coaster. Painful moments after painful moments after painful moments. But the Lord was with Joseph. And can I encourage you today? You are not alone. Just like Joseph, God is here with you today. The presence of pain doesn't equal the absence of God. The presence of pain magnifies the victory when God comes through. God is not intimidated by your painful moments. Pain is not something you can avoid, but it's something you can change your perspective on. Like maybe you lost a job and you're asking yourself, God, what do I do now? But maybe you had to lose what he had and what you were doing so that way you can attain what he wanted for you. Just like grapes have to endure pressure and being crushed on every side to let what's inside of it come out, we have to experience the same thing. We need to experience pain because there's a greatness inside of you that God wants to pull out of you. The Lord is with you through your pain. Pain is not something you can avoid. Your pain produces perseverance. Joseph had to experience pain so he could understand how to process pain. Yes, your pain is part of preparation, but your pain is not in vain. God wants to use your pain so he can bring out and build you back better. And that is the pain of preparation. Hey, Journey Church. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, my name is Jaylene. I am now a fourth year student at Journey Leadership Academy and I get to serve here as the online director. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the product of preparation. We are continuing Joseph's story, and at this point, two years had passed. The pharaoh of Egypt had begun having dreams that no one could interpret. But then the cupbearer remembered Joseph, and so the pharaoh came and sent for Joseph to interpret his dreams. We're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 41, 22 through 27. 
In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin, and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. They are the same dream. They, the seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years. And so the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind, there are seven years of famine. Now, if that sounded a whole lot of nonsense about grain and cows, let me break it down to you. All that Joseph is telling the Pharaoh is, hey, there's going to be seven good years of plentiful harvest, but then there's going to be seven bad years of famine. They're the same dream. And so Joseph, we hear that Mariana and Christian are talking a lot about what's happening to Joseph, but we are finally seeing what's happening through Joseph. Because Joseph was thrown into the pit when he was 17, but he didn't step foot into the palace until he was 30 years old. And so he waited approximately 13 years to fully step into his purpose. So what is the product of preparation? The product of preparation is patience. A little bit about me is I started coming, I gave my life to God when I was 13 years old, but I didn't start coming to Journey Church until I was 17. And so I took about four and a half years to truly get to know who God was. But when I came to Journey Church, I knew that the Lord was telling me that I could no longer remain hidden, that he had deposited giftings and teachings inside of me that now needed to be put into action. But I didn't know anybody. So I joined Journey Youth. Journey Youth, get some noise. I joined Journey Youth so I could meet people my own age, but your girl was so unbearably shy. So I joined the greeters team to help me be outgoing and to help me get out of my shell. I worked a lot of jobs I didn't really care about to make ends meet. But when I was 19, I joined JLA and that's when my life really changed. You see, Joseph had a gift, but it wasn't until the Pharaoh gave him an opportunity, that's when he was able to show the gift that God had given him. When I was 19, Pastor JJ gave me a similar opportunity. He invited me to come and preach at a worship night we have in the beginning of every year. And I'm going to be honest, you guys, I did not want to do it. I was terrified. I felt like who would want to hear from a 19-year-old Hispanic girl? But then the Lord reminded me that he had been preparing me and equipping me every day up until that moment to do the calling he had given me. And since that day, I preach on several Sundays. I preach at conferences at this church and others, got hired at the same church that saved my life and continued to get opportunities to preach the gospel and make God's name known. But that did not happen overnight. Me standing in front of you today is a product of eight years of preparation. And I really wish I could say that I was patient throughout this process, but I was not. I can't tell you how many conversations I had with Josue where he had to remind me to be patient when I wanted to drop out and quit my degree and all the college students said amen. When he had to give me running to have patience when I doubted my calling and doubted what God was doing inside of me. But it wasn't until I surrendered my own timeline to the Lord and had patience in my preparation, that's when I got the job. That's when I received the calling and that's when I got the home that I had been praying for. So in your preparation, do not grow impatient, grow in patience. There are two areas of your life that you can grow in. You're either going to grow towards your impatience or you're either going to grow towards your patience. Either way, you're going to produce fruit, but you decide which it is going to be from. Because let's keep it real, y'all. Nobody likes to wait. We have Amazon Prime where items get delivered in a day. Uber Eats and DoorDash where we get food delivered straight to our doorstop. Instagram and TikTok where we get instant entertainment within seconds. Pills that help us get skinny quick. So many get rich quick schemes. Nobody likes to wait. Even something as simple as driving. How many of us hate red lights? Come on, keep it real. But would you imagine what would actually happen if we only ever had green lights? It would be crazy, especially with the way Florida drivers are. That's why some of you don't have journey stickers on your cars because of the way you drive, okay? It's okay, I don't have a journey sticker on my car. But red lights are essential because it ensures that we have a system where we stop, a system where we slow down, and a system where we can go. Because our lives are not always meant to be on go, go, go. But why is having patience even important? Because like the red lights we follow, patience keeps us safe. If we didn't have patience, we'll be rushing into all sorts of things. You might be rushing into Target, but you're going to rush into an argument with your husband on that receipt, girl. You may be rushing that relationship, but you're actually going to rush out of it too. 
You might rush into that loan, but you're actually rushing into debt. You might be rushing your healing, but you're actually prolonging your growth. You might be rushing out of the building after service, but you're actually missing out on meeting your future spouse in the lobby. Just saying, take it easy. Maybe say hello to some people. You may be rushing out of the house to get to work, but you're actually missing out on breakfast with your kids. You might be rushing for my youth in the building. You might be rushing to be an adult, but you're actually rushing the development of your character. Patience is what kept Joseph safe. Because if we remember, Joseph didn't head straight into the palace. Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house. But that situation could have gone real different if Joseph didn't have patience. Instead, he adopted patience, organized the house, and eventually became the overseer of that house. And when Joseph was in the prison, he organized the prison and became the overseer of that prison. But imagine if Joseph was trying to rush his sentence, trying to escape, he would have never gotten into the palace. Here's where I'm trying to get at with this talk. The reason why we get stuck in our preparation is not because God isn't working. It's because we don't see where he's taking us. We lose patience when we feel like we don't see the big picture, when we feel like there's not victory at the end. I don't know where you're at in this room. Maybe you're watching online as well, but you're thinking to yourself, how long will I stay at this job? My boss is cutting my hours or giving me a hard time. I just want to be in my career already. Or how long until I find my home? You've been searching the market, but inflation keeps going up and you can't find a place to put your family or how long until I get the healing you have a disease and you're wondering if your sickness is ever going to get better or how long will I deal with this pain you lost a loved one and you're fighting in your grieving season we lose this impatience with God but have you ever stopped to think how much patience he has with us God is not preparing us for his entertainment he is preparing us before the place he is taking us because he wants to protect us imagine if Pastor JJ let me on the stage with no prior experience, this would be very hard to listen to. But imagine if Joseph would have gone straight from the pit right to the palace. It was because Joseph knew how to organize the Potiphar's house and how to organize the prison, that's how he knew what to do when the seven good years came and the seven bad years came. Hear me, hear me when I say this. Joseph's dreams got him into the pit, but it was Joseph's ability to interpret dreams that got him into the palace. Did you catch it? Joseph's dreams got him into the pit, but it was Joseph's dreams that got him into the palace. In other words, the very thing you feel like God is using to destroy you is the same thing that God is using to develop you. So you can look back at your life and say, that's why I went through that relationship. So I know what not to expect in a future spouse or marriage. That's why I went through that tough season so I could teach others how to get through the storms in life. That's why I lost that loved one so I could understand how to value and appreciate the small moments in life. Even Jesus is patient with us. It says in Revelation 3.20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is God, guys. He could push open the door. He could force us to bow down and worship him, but God is not pushy. He's patient. And even in his, in his patience, he is preparing for us still. It says in John 1, 4, verses 2 through 3, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus is preparing a place for him to be with him forever and eternity. So I don't know where you find yourself at in this place. Maybe you're struggling with your posture, going through the pain, or struggling with the impatience of your preparation season. Maybe you hear God knocking on the door and you are finally ready to open it. So let's give them Privacy Journey Church. If we can all bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to pray two prayers. The first prayer is gonna be for those in the building who don't know God, but they want to, or maybe they knew God before and it's been a while since they had a relationship with Christ. I'm gonna to count to three. And when I say three, I want you to lift your hand as a physical act of surrenderance to the Lord. One, he wants to open the door to your heart. Two, he wants you to come back home to him. And three, if you're ready to give your life to Christ, raise that hand, raise that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, amen. Well, hey, we don't want them to walk this out alone. We're gonna pray this prayer together. Worship team, if you could help me out. Father God, I give my life to you. I am ready to open the door to my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I love you, Lord. Amen. Amen, let's give it up for those who decide to give their life to Christ. Amen. 
Eva Lise is going to come on stage and she's going to tell you some next steps because we're so happy for you and we want to walk this out with you. But before we do, I just want to pray one more prayer and it's for those in this place who do know Christ as Lord and who are struggling in their preparation season. Father, I thank you for allowing us to have a place where we can humbly go to you, where we can surrender our lives to you. For those in this place who are struggling with waiting, wondering when you are going to give them the promise that you have promised them, allow them to have patience to know that you are only preparing them because you truly want the best for them. We love you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship our wonderful God. Thank you so much for watching. Don't let the journey stop here. We'd love for you to do one of three things, either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry blessed you at all, subscribe so that you can find out when the next video comes out. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to support us financially, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for your time. God bless.